Now you can also track the bill and, and stuff on, on the left hand side that's now outstanding. The bill is in the accounts payable. So if I go to the expenses and then the vendors, then you've got a bill for, and again, it's kind of limited because this is limiting to 365 up top, but I believe it was in here. And then now you've got your, your bill and you can have a payment, uh, schedule a payment for the bill. So that's the next step that would happen, you know, typically with a bill. Let's assume now you could make the payment here using a payment form and then use the bank feeds to double check the payment form that you would make. Or I can try to wait till something clears the bank and attach it to the bill with the bank feeds, which will record this next step. So let's let's try to do it that way. I'm going to I'm going to go to the bank feeds and say, OK, now this transaction has been recorded. I'm going to say this was one on on uh, the 1017 one for thirty dollars. That's the one I think. And so let's take this one. I know the dates are way far off, but let's just imagine that this one now is a payment that I'm not going to use to record the inventory. But instead, I already recorded the inventory. I'm going to try to match it up to the transaction that I have already put in place. So I'm going to try to find a match to it. And then I'm going to change the date from 010122. And so there's our bill that it's matching up. Now, if these things were close in time frame, QuickBooks might try to try to match it beforehand. It might have picked it up because I put them so distant in time. QuickBooks had trouble picking it up. And if I and notice I'm matching to a bill now. So if I had entered the bill as with an expense form or paid the bill with an expense or check form or pay bill form, then then it would match to the pay bill form. And that might be easier for QuickBooks to met, to match up. But I'm going to select the bill. So what's that going to do? It's in essence going to enter the pay bill form. So now I have if I look at the flow chart, I had a bill that was put in place. I'm using the bank feeds in between here. So instead of me paying the bill and then matching it to QuickBooks, I'm going to use use the bank feeds to to basically record the pay bill, matching it to the bill after it's actually cleared the bank. All right, so let's do it. So we're going to say that looks good. And I think that's good. So then I'm going to have then I'm going to save it. And so now we've recorded that transaction. So if I go to the balance sheet, run it again. Now we've got the checking account impacted. The checking account, notice it created a pay bill form instead of the normal expense form because the pay bill form is basically like an expense form, but it's, it's got a, its own special designation noting that it's used to decrease the accounts payable as opposed to a normal expense form or check form, which is decreasing the checking account, the other side going to somewhere like utilities or something. So if I go into this one drilling down on it, then we've got the pay bill form. This is what the pay bill form you know, typically looks like. We did it through the matching format of the bank feeds. So it doesn't take us to the bank feeds, it takes us to the, to the form, closing this back out. And then the other side, if I go back on up top, went to the accounts payable, which is now back to zero accounts payable has now been paid so if i go into that th this is what we expect to see in accounts payable bill goes up it goes down with the pay bill so the inventory adds a little bit of complexity there now obviously that's just on the inventory for the purchase side of things the next step would be for us to sell the inventory and so when we sell the inventory i can't wait till it clears the bank I'd have to sell the inventory with a sales receipt or an invoice in order for QuickBooks to track the inventory, which would reduce, you know, the inventory and record the cost of goods sold on a perpetual inventory system. So let's just take a look at that. So if I went back on over and said, let's make an invoice, I'm going to go to the first tab, new button, I'm going to make an invoice. And let's say this is going to be for customer one. Now customer one has this thing that's linked to it because I made the item billable. So it's trying to pull it in, but there's a bit of a problem. If I hit add, I'm going to say, okay, let's just tap through this so I don't forget anything. And so I'm just going to make the date closer to real time. Let's make it like 10.01.22 or something like that, that I'm going to sell it on. 
And then down here, it pulled in the item, but notice it pulled it in at the wrong rate. It pulled in the cost, not the sales price. So what I'll do is I'll just double check the inventory item down here. It should be sold for $60. So I'm gonna change this to 60 to reflect the proper price. The link works good. The cost of goods sold, I think will be recorded correctly, but that's something I wanna point out as a little tricky thing with regards to if you're trying to use that billable item with inventory items. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna trash the one below. Now this actually does a lot. This transaction is recording a lot at the same time now. It's an invoice. It's gonna increase accounts payable by the full amount, the $60. The other side is gonna to go to sales or revenue driven by the item, which I believe we told it to go to sale of product revenue. If there was sales tax, it would also record the sales tax on it, but we're not gonna deal with the sales tax at this point. And then also the inventory is gonna go down by $30, I believe we set it up for, which is the cost not showing on the invoice because we don't wanna show the cost to the client and cost of goods sold, the expense related to the purchase will also be recorded at $30 and the impact on net income will be the sales price 60 minus $30 or 30 and the sub ledger for the customer will be impacted tracking the receivables by customer and the sub ledger for inventory will be impacted showing the units of inventory impacted as well as the dollar amount so actually a lot going on here in a perpetual inventory system when you check something out at, at a grocery store check register or something, there's a lot going on, even though the transaction is quite simple to facilitate once it's all set up. So if I save it and close it, just to double check that, go into the balance sheet, we can then run it. We got accounts receivable going up by the 60, that there's that, the other side's going to the income statement. If I run the income statement, we've got income going up at the 60. If I go back to the balance sheet, we also have the inventory which should be going down so if i have the inventory going down by the 30 so it went up and then it went back down again and then if i go back to the balance sheet cost of goods sold if i go into the cost of goods sold it was recorded at the 30. the impact on the income statement would be the increase to the income statement which was 60 minus the impact on cost of goods sold which was 30 and Back to the balance sheet, the inventory subledger should track the information in the subledger. It's back down to zero, nothing's in it, even though that doesn't match what's on the balance sheet because we've recorded that $160 amount not using items uh, in a prior presentation. And then of course we can track the accounts receivable if we use an accounts receivable and the next step there would be we're gonna receive a payment on it, but we'll talk more about that in future presentations.